My name's Slurpee. The dog. What the dog do? And two years ago, I made a video on my channel called 50 Years of Moon, and it was made to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the moon landing in 1969. And it's a roller coaster. I didn't have a script, and my only real directive was to just talk about moon-related topics. So it ended up just being me rambling about random things about the moon for like 11 minutes. I also did this sort of ongoing joke where I was the one and the same with the moon, like some sort of Hellboy 2 situation. For some reason... Channel alert! Hey, we talking channel alert? No! Go away! the video I'm originally from! If not now, when? I don't know. But if I ever get sponsorships, <laughs> so I'll, I'll give you a call. Fine by me. Do any of you know who that was? No, of course you don't! With the release of 51 years of Moon in 2020, which I would say was a much more competent attempt at a video, but just ended up being worse in the long run. I kind of implied that this would become an annual thing on my channel. And so, here we are in 2021 with 52 Years of Moon, a video I'm sure I'll absolutely despise by 2022. <laughs> The way that this horrible video is going to be structured is in sort of top 10 form, except it's top 8 because I'm lazy. I'll be going over 8 moon moments, basically just notable events in history or pop culture that happen to involve the moon. Yes, I'm basically just stealing Junkie Janker's top 10 monkey moments video and changing El Mono to La Luna. And these to Ocho. Ocho. These are not going to be in any particular order though, just in whatever random series I feel like. It might end off with something truly hilarious. But that's it. Some of these moments were actually submitted in the comments of the last video. Since I, for whatever reason, have a bit of faith in this structure, I welcome you to write some more random mood events in the comments of this video for next year. I'll probably not include them, but I mean, why not? Alright, I think I talked about everything I need to, so let's, let's just, just jump, jump in. in. Not even that lolly on the other page is sexier than math. For the first item on our list of moon happenings, we will be taking a look at one of the most legendary portrayals of the moon in the realm of fiction. The time it was stolen by the gloves of running urgently. I recently rewatched Despicable Me and it holds up surprisingly well with it having a nice message and funny dialogue. I sit on the toilet. Sure, it was responsible for the creation of certain fictional characters, but they aren't really that bad in their first outing. Groot begins formulating plans to steal the moon when his soon-to-be arch-nemesis, Vector, manages to steal an entire pyramid of Egypt despite being a beta male. As a sigma male, it's Groot's responsibility to humiliate any and all beta males to no end, and Groot was ready to destroy the dreams of Mr. Average Reddit user. Like any good sigma male, Groot doesn't view women as the objective, but a means. A means to steal the moon! So, he adopts three children to secretly enlist them in his quest for moon domination. Over the course of the movie, he grows attached to them, treating them as if they were his own children. Unfortunately, his fellow Sigma male, Dr. Nefario, recognizes that Gru is slowly turning into an alpha. In a last ditch effort to keep Gru Sigma, Dr. Nefario sends the girls back to the orphanage. Eventually, Gru is able to steal the moon by drastically shrinking it, which provides a short montage of the effects of the moon basically not having any power of the earth anymore, including tides no longer existing and denying a man of being a furry. However, fully completed his arc of becoming an alpha male, Gru tries to see his girls dance recital, only to find that Vector beat him to the punch. Vector offers to exchange the girls for the moon, which Gru agrees to. Wow, what a nice trade deal. I hope neither member of the trade decides to go back on the deal. I think I'll hold out to them a little while longer. Yeah! As Gru rushes to save the girls, it's revealed that the shrink ray is actually faulty, and will eventually reset the size of any object that it shrinks. I call it the Nefario Principle! The moon begins regrowing while inside Vector's jet, distracting and disorienting him enough to allow Gru to save the girls. The moon eventually grows back to its original size, with Vector stranded on it. 
As he looks at his new, bleak surroundings, he can only say one very funny word. Poop. So, I don't know how bad y'all's senses of humor were when you were younger. And of course, there's the argument that it's only gotten worse. But mine was bad enough to consider Thundermans a good show. For functioning members of society, Thundermans was basically Nickelodeon's take on Incredibles, showcasing an average family that happens to have superpowers. Every member of the family had a different superpower, like super strength, super speed, etc, etc. The little girl character, who I do remember the name of, but don't care at all to say, had the ability of laser eyes. In one of the episodes, she writes her name on the moon with her laser eyes, permanently marking her name there. Now, this isn't actually what number seven is about. Bear with me here. What if, instead of marking the name of a probable future dream standing in the moon, we put the pizza hut? Now, you may not have liked that idea so much, but Pizza Hut would have. <laughs> Because in 1999, Pizza Hut had this very idea. They were going to permanently carve their logo onto the moon's surface so that every night when you went to gaze at the moon, Pizza Hut would be staring back at you. Pizza the Hut! You can't out Pizza the Hut if the Hut is the entire moon! But there was just one problem with the idea. No one wants that! But Pizza Hut didn't care. They're a big How corporation. They like money. So the plans proceeded to put their logo on the moon. But there was just one problem. If the logo was to be visible from Earth, it would need to be the size of Texas. Upon hearing of the amount of ground needed to be covered, alongside calculating the cost needed to do so, the idea was scrapped and the moon thankfully remained pizza-less. Okay, but like, if it happened, it, it would be terrible, obviously. It would go down in history as one of the worst things a brand has ever done. But it'd be pretty funny. We rapping now? We rapping? Show them who you really are, notorious P.I.G. Okay, number six is the moon landing. Uh, I already made, like, two videos about this. It's, like, the reason that this video exists. They, they wanted to go to the moon, and, and they did. And he said, like, small step for man. That's what happened. Hello there, Block Knights. My name is Castle Block, and I am a new YouTuber. Come with me now on a journey through time and space, because number five is about the mighty boot. The Mighty Boosh was a BBC series starred by these two funny men, and what I can only assume was an attempt to make a show where every episode is the worst ass trip possible. Surprisingly, this idea works very well, and the show is incredibly funny. Until the credits roll, you have no idea what's going to happen next. The show is constantly keeping you on your toes. Nickelodeon. I won't spoil anything, but... Milky Joe. It's not perfect by any means. I mean, it's incredibly dated, and, uh, it's, it's British. But none of that discounts how good the actual show itself is. But enough about that. We need to talk about a certain character within the show. When you are the moon. In season two, a running gag was starred where around three times per episode, the episode's events would completely stop to pay attention to the moon, played by Noel Fielding and a bunch of whipped cream. And he just says the dumbest ever. When I say the episode's events stop, I mean it. I can only think of three or so times where whatever the moon says is actually plot relevant or even references the events that's happening in the plot. He will straight up just show up for 15 seconds, ramble, and then leave as if nothing happened. I went to a dinner party for all the planets and uh, Uranus, he knocked up spaghetti bolognese. Do you have a single fact to back that up? This show could have easily existed and still be the borderline masterpiece that it is without the moon. Technically speaking, it adds nothing. But they went the extra mile to add a character who just shows up whenever he wants, explains FNAF lore, then leaves. What's not to like? He even does a bit of boring! Yeah, and the imposter. This is Mac Knight, and he is a national treasure. It really says a lot about our society that McDonald's has had several dozen mascots appear in long-running commercials, and yet, Mac Knight, 
a guy with a moon for a head who only appeared in a few ads, Bro. manages to be one of the most well-known and popular McDonald's mascots of all time. He was even popular enough to get his own 5 Neff Freddy fan game. Yeah. He looks like the Max Shut Headroom up, guy if his head was a moon. And I don't mean that as an insult. He pulls off the look flawlessly. Yeah. You don't know what love is until you see Mac tonight. If I was alive during the 80s, I would literally break out of my house, drive the car despite being underaged, just so I can get to the McDonald's dinner service, simply because Mac tonight told me to do so. The crescent moon-shaped head really completes the look of this guy. Sure, he'd be hard yeah. to kiss, which, when compared to the fact that he seems like a bit of a ladies' man, seems kind of contradictory. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? But it allows him to sport an incredibly iconic design while also perfectly representing what he's supposed to advertise. Forget Ronald McDonald, Grimace, the Hamburglar, or the Minions. Mac tonight is easily the best McDonald's mascot to ever exist. So what copyright laws did McDonald's forget to read this time? At this point, I'm just waiting for Nintendo to sue them for something. It, it's bound to happen. Now we're going to be talking about Dionk Gyonk. So basically... How did he do this? Like, like, how did he do this? How did a hairy ape manage to deliver a Mike Tyson's punch out so hard it knocked the moon out of orbit? My man could literally set the plot of Majora's Mask in motion at any time he wants. Actually, on that subject, in that game, it takes four big, strong, sexy giants to push the moon away, and they use like 90% of their power. And if you remember, the actual real life moon is like 30 times the size of freaking Zam Wessel over here. This means that Donkey Kong is approximately 13 million times stronger than four giant ancient gods. What the f I hate this boss fight so much. All right, for our final moon momento, I've picked something rather special. The number one spot of 52 years of moon will be going to... The total and utter annihilation of the moon? Look outside. Oh no! Oh no! Oh no! Hey man! What the frick are you doing? I'm having a little bit of fun. I don't have time to wait until you say it's my time to shine. I am Mahogi, greatest enchanter across all the universes, and I- Oh, Sid, you finally said your name. Um... Yes. Anyways, I am Mahogi, and right now I'm feeling a little bit attention depraved, so... I'm going to blow up the moon. I really think that you should reconsider your actions. Holy cupcake, are you kidding me? Oh, it's beautiful. Honestly, I sort of agree. Hey, aren't you supposed to be like one and the same with the moon or something? Like. Shouldn't you be in immense pain right now? Oh, uh, no. I stopped doing that joke a while ago, and... Oh! Yeah. Well, darling, I'm really enjoying myself right now, but I don't want you to die. Uh, I'm just gonna reverse time in a few hours so that everything's back to normal, but still get some time to, you know, enjoy this. Valid. I believe it's now... Outro time.